Yeah. So, uh, good evening, good morning, wherever you are, depending on that. Great to have you all with us again. And very happy to welcome Latham Boyle to give the 23rd Osmo lecture. It's interesting, in 2023, we had exactly 23 lectures. This will be the final lecture of this year, and we start in February next year. So uh, Latham is currently a researcher at the Higgs Center for Theoretical Physics of the University of Edinburgh. He moved uh, there last year, and before that, he was a faculty at the Perimeter Institute. And Latham obtained his PhD from Princeton University in 2006, and was then a postdoctoral fellow at the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics before joining Perimeter. Latham has very diverse and wide-ranging research interests, which cover cosmology, particle physics, gravitational waves, black holes, and mathematical physics. And some very interesting works have come out in the last few years. In 2018, along with collaborators, Latham proposed a new cosmological model, the CPT symmetric universe in which the universe before the Big Bang is the CPT mirror image of the universe after the bang, and the model has some very nice uh, predictions. Latham would also like to understand where the unexplained structures and patterns in the standard model of particle physics come from. And in this context, there was a very interesting paper a few years back titled The Standard Model, Exceptional Jordan Algebra and Triality. Latham is also fascinated by self-similar quasi-periodic tilings, such as Penrose tilings, both because of their mathematical beauty and because of their connections to physics, for example, as a new tool for discretizing scale-invariant physical systems. So today, this is the topic of Latham's talk. The Penrose tiling is a quantum error correcting code. Really looking forward to it. Over to you, Latham. Okay, well, thanks so much for the introduction to gender. Um, yeah, oops, my iPad has logged me out. Okay, yes, yeah, so so I wanted to talk about this uh, um, feed about this, uh, this 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 topic. Penrose tiling is a quantum error correcting code. This is a new result that uh, we are excited about. Uh, it it was described, so I'll mainly be talking about this result that was uh, shown in this recent paper that appeared in the archive about a month ago uh, by Julie and myself. Um, and I want to really emphasize here um, that uh, that Ju, uh is the first author of the paper. He's the lead author of the paper, and he's really a very remarkable, uh, 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 very brilliant uh, person. Uh, who uh, he's, he's in a, he, his, his main work is in a different field than is the focus of this uh, lecture series. But but uh, he's a really uh, really very brilliant person, and um, uh, yeah, he's a postdoc at PI currently. Um, anyway, uh, so. Um, Let's see. I, I also wanted to uh, uh, highlight right at the outset uh, uh, the uh, independent work of Hilary Carteret, who's also on the call, uh, who's also been thinking for years about uh, the, the connection between the Penrose tiling and, uh, and, and quantum error correcting codes and, uh, and, and has been uh, sort of independently pursuing a very, a very different, very creative uh, approach to uh, getting quantum error correcting codes from Penrose tilings. Uh, she gave a, a nice talk about that in 2017 at Perimeter that you can, uh, the video of that talk is, it, you can see it's on the Perimeter uh, video archive, PERSA. Um, so I encourage you to have a look at that. Um, okay, so yes, yeah, so so my plan was that I was going to basically briefly introduce the Penrose tiling, uh, and then I was going to uh, briefly introduce what quantum error correcting codes are um, and then explain explain why they're why why, why they're related to one another um, and then uh, and then at the end I was going to uh, explain uh, say get make some comments about how this all relates to uh, the theme of this uh, 
work the, the seminar series, which is more about Octonians and the standard model. So those will be more speculative uh, comments at the end, um, but also about how, how it relates to uh, how, the sense in which it, it kind of smells like this quantum error correcting code uh, ha has, has, has some properties that make it seem suspiciously like a, a, a model for the microstates underlying space-time and, uh, and uh, 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 anyway, I'll get to that, at the, I'll get to that uh, towards the end. Okay, so to start with, to introduce the Penrose tiling, I was going to start with a, a, a famous uh, theorem about ordinary uh, crystallography. So, so uh, there's a famous theorem about patterns that do have translational symmetry um, that uh, that they can only have points with two, three, four, or six-fold rotational symmetry. Those are the only types of symmetry that are allowed. So here I've shown two famous patterns with translational symmetry, the square tiling and the hexagonal tiling. And you can already see in these tilings all the different types of allowed symmetry. So if we if we rotate this tiling, the square tiling around any vertex, that, that, that vertex is a point of fourfold symmetry. You can rotate by any multiple of a fourth of a turn and uh, um, any integer. You can rotate it by a fourth of a turn and, and, and the pattern's carried into itself. Similarly, if you rotate about the center of any square in the tiling, uh, if you rotate about the center of any edge in the tiling, that's a point of twofold symmetry. Uh, over in the hexagonal tiling, we see that if you rotate around the center of any hexagon in the tiling, that's a point of six-fold symmetry. Uh, whereas if you rotate about the point where three hexagons meet, that's a that's a point of three-fold symmetry. And then again, the edge midpoint is another point of two-fold symmetry. And the theorem is that those are the only types of symmetries that you can find. That 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 that, that, that there's something incompatible about any other type of symmetry and in translational invariance. And so here's a little proof at the bottom. Here's a little sketch of a proof of why five-fold symmetry uh, is not compatible with translational invariance. So the basic idea here is, okay, suppose we have one point um, of, uh, of, of, of five-fold symmetry, one point, a purple point, around which life looks symmetric. If you rotate it, nothing is changed if, you, if, you, if the observer stands there and rotates by a fifth of a turn. But then the idea is, okay, suppose, let's prove by contradiction that that point can't be living in a lattice, but that also has the translational symmetry of that lattice. Well, the proof by contradiction is that, you know, so because it's living in a lattice with translational symmetry, if, if there's one five-fold symmetric point, then there must be all the translations, all the lattice translations of that five-fold symmetric point also. Um, so there's going to be an infinite number of points of five-fold symmetry. And let's, let's, choose a nearest neighbor pair, okay? So let's, let's let, imagine the blue, the purple point and the blue point are two nearest neighbor pairs of five-fold five -fold symmetric points. Well, then someone standing at the, at the purple five-fold point, if they see a blue five-fold point over here, they have to see another blue five-fold point over here. On the other hand, someone standing at the blue five-fold point, if they see a purple five-fold point to their left over here, they also have to see a second five-fold point over here. But you see that in that way, we've constructed a new pair of five-fold points that are closest, that, that are closer to one another than the pair that we started with. But the idea was the pair we started with was the nearest neighbor point, so that's a contradiction. So, um, okay, so, uh, so then people were interested uh, uh, in the 60s and 70s, mathematicians were interested in the question of whether you could find tilings that uh, that uh, had no translational symmetry, set, sets of tiles where you could tile the plane, but only in patterns that had no translational symmetry. And uh, Penrose famously discovered uh, 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 in the 70s a very beautiful example uh, uh, of, of such a tiling. Um, uh, and it made use of this fact. He basically constructed a tiling that intrinsically did tile the plane, but did have, could have points of five-fold symmetry. And as a consequence, by this theorem, it couldn't have translational invariance. Okay, and so here's a picture of the Penrose tiling. Um, uh, and uh, 
you know, that there, the, this this led to a burst of a lot, many interesting things being discovered about 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 aperiodic tilings. Um, in particular, in the early days, uh, to my knowledge, there were these four key people who made a lot of the a lot of the key discoveries in the seventies. Uh, th three of these people, Penrose, Con John Conway, and De Bruyne, are are famous mathematicians. Uh, Robert Amon at the top actually was not a professional mathematician. He was an amateur amateur mathematician, uh, apparently an avid reader of Martin Gardner's Scientific American column. And he never uh, really wrote papers on his own. He, he worked he worked in a, I, I think he worked in a as a mail sorter in a post office, actually. But uh, but he made a lot of very fundamental contributions to the early uh, development of this field and in particular found the eightfold symmetric and 12-fold symmetric analogs of the Penrose tiling. Um, and unfortunately, he was, uh, he, he died uh, uh, young. He was a bit of, he was apparently a kind of reclusive person and, and unfortunately died young. So uh, we, we, I think we mostly know about what he did through things he wrote to, letters he wrote to Martin Gardner describing what he'd figured out. Um, so I recommend, by the way, I recommend this original Martin Gardner article, which was this famous article, which was the one that first introduced, or at least to my knowledge, first introduced the Penrose tiling, or maybe first introduced it to a wide audience. Um, I also recommend this this uh, this article by Marjorie Seneschal called "The Mysterious Mister Amen," uh, which is a biographical article about about Amen, who was quite a fascinating uh, person. Um, one interesting thing I learned from, I, I just want to, I can't resist saying one more thing about Amon here. I, um, she mentioned, Marjorie Seneschal mentions in her, in her, um, article, uh, that, that Amon only ever wrote one paper himself and that he, he never got it published. Um, and I, I asked if she had a copy, she, I asked if she got, had a copy of that paper and she dug up a copy of the manuscript and sent it to me. Um, so this is uh, from from covered with uh, mold stains because it was in for decades in her back uh, in a storage place in her backyard. Um, so that here is here is his here is the one article that he did write. Uh, it, it, the title is an unorthodox explanation of the Cretaceous Tertiary Boundary Event. So he submitted it to Nature apparently, but it, it never got sent out for refereeing. Um, so it, it looks, if you read it, it, it looks, it looks a, a, a superficially like a very uh, standard uh, uh, article you might read in Nature. But the bottom line is that you know there had recently been been Luis Alvarez and his son Walter Alvarez had recently discovered this layer of radioactive cesium at 65 million years depth in the Earth's crust, and the standard explanation for that was that uh, a, a meteor impact at 65 million years ago had killed off the dinosaurs um but uh but uh this paper is proposing an alternative interpretation which is that the uh dinosaurs uh became highly intelligent uh about 65 million years ago and then uh blew themselves up in a nuclear war and it's the nuclear uh the, the, the nuclear contamination from that from that war that uh, that 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 is responsible for the radioactive cesium layer sixty five million years ago. Anyway, it's actually kind of an interesting paper. But I mentioned to I, I mentioned it because, to show that that he was a uh, unorthodox unorthodox thinker. Okay, so next I wanted to to uh, explain a few um, uh, different ways of 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 looking at or constructing the Penrose tiling that 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 will uh be uh three different ways that'll be helpful for us uh later when we uh are 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 are, are, are explaining the relation to the, to quantum error correcting codes. Okay, so the first is that it, it has this property that 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 it that there's an inflation rule so that the, the 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 tiling well if we if we look back at the if we look back at the Penrose tiling you'll see it's it's made of two different tiles a thin rhombus this blue rhombus here um, and uh, a, a a fat rhombus the red rhombus and uh, the idea of the inflation rule is that every time you have a patch of tiles made of these blue and red tiles uh, you can obtain a new patch with more tiles by by taking every blue rhombus and replacing it cutting it into uh, pieces, uh, uh, according to this, uh, shown in this picture here, um, 
and uh, taking every red rhombus and cutting it, it, it into pieces, according to this picture here. And in that way, and then iterating that process, you, you generate larger and larger um, patches of the Penrose tiling. So here, for example, if we start with this five-pointed star and apply this rule once, we get this larger patch. And then we, we, we apply the inflation rule again, we get this yet larger patch. And uh, as you apply it infinitely many times, you can get an infinitely large uh, patch, which covers the entire plane. And this picture might give you the sense that there's a kind of unique or nearly unique Penrose tiling, but actually a, a better way to think about it is that is to think of the inverse inverse process, the the the, the deflation rule, which takes which takes a patch here and 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 glues tiles together to get to get to get a to get a patch with fewer tiles, et cetera. And you can think of the Penrose tiling as any tiling where you can apply that deflation rule an infinite number of times. Um, and actually, it turns out that there are there are actually an infinite number of distinct Penrose tilings uh, uh, in that sense. Um, but they're all very difficult to tell apart from one another. They're all locally indistinguishable from one another. So globally, there's an infinite number of, di of globally distinct Penrose tilings in the sense that if I have one tiling and a second tiling, there's no way for me to line them up so that they agree everywhere. However, it, any finite patch, no matter how large, that appears in one of those two tilings also appears in the other one. And so if I plunked you down in one of the Penrose tilings, and gave you the rest of your life to explore it, uh, you would never be able to figure out which one I had put you in. Okay, so here is a second way to make such a tiling. Um, you, it's, it's the so-called cut and project method. So here the idea is you start that to obtain uh, a, a Penrose-like tiling, an aperiodic tiling, uh, a, 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 a tiling with no translational symmetry in a certain dimension, you start with a lattice that is periodic but lives in a higher dimension, and then you take an irrationally sloped slice through that higher dimensional lattice, and uh, and the the, the, the non-periodic tiling comes from that comes from the intersection of that irrationally sloped slice with the higher dimensional lattice. So here, I'm, I'm, for the sake of being able to draw all of this, I'm doing an analogous, I'm constructing an analogous tiling that lives in one lower dimension. So the Penrose tiling is a two-dimensional tiling, which comes from a four-dimensional lattice called the A4 lattice, the A4 root lattice. But here in this picture, I'm, I'm showing how you can construct a one-dimensional analog of the Penrose tiling called the Fibonacci tiling. Okay, this is sort of the closest one-dimensional cousin of the Penrose tiling. You can construct it starting from a two-dimensional square lattice. So here's my two-dimensional square lattice. And now how do I construct it? Well, I take a square from the lattice. Okay, uh, I, I put it anywhere I want. And then I slide it along some irrationally sloped line. If I want to get the Fibonacci, this Fibonacci tiling, it turns out I want to take the slope to be uh, one over the golden ratio. Okay, so that's that's how I get my orange strip here. And then the idea is that every time my orange strip intersects one of the vertices of the lattice, uh, I project, I orthogonally project that vertex onto the, the line who, who, whose slope I'm using to, to create the strip. And what you see is that I'll get two different types of I'll, so I'll, I'll generate in that way. I'll generate in that way a one-dimensional pattern with two different tiles: a long tile, a short tile, long, long, short, long, short, long, long, short. The reason there's only two tiles is because if you look at the strip here, uh, you'll see that there's only two ways for the uh, for the for the for neighboring um, vertices in the higher dimensional lattice to be related to one another. They can either be next to one another horizontally, in which case they project to one of the long tiles, or they can be next to one another vertically, in which case they can project, they, pro they orthogonally project to one of the short tiles. And because the slope is irrational, you can convince yourself that the patterns of longs and shorts will have this aperiodic property. It, 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 there, there'll be no translation that carries it uh, in, into itself. Um, and as I say, the Penrose tiling is really can be constructed very analogously, except now we start from the four-dimensional 
A4 root lattice, a particularly symmetrical lattice in four dimensions, four dimensional Euclidean space. And now we take a particularly symmetric two dimensional slice through that lattice, uh, one of the eigenplanes of the so called coxeter element of the A4 root lattice. Um, and uh, but 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 this, it's the same idea. We 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 create a thickened strip around that around that uh, slice, and then the points that we project uh, onto the two D slice from the four D lattice are the vertices of the Penrose tiling. Okay, and yet here's a finally a third a third way to think about the to think about the Penrose tiling. Okay, so in this picture, uh, the purple lines if you just forget the blue lines and just focus on the purple lines that's the penrose tiling so again you'll see that there are just our two old friends the the fat rhombus here and uh and the thin rhombus here uh uh and so now what we've done this was discovered by Amon, is that you can decorate these two tiles with uh you can decorate each each fat rhombus with a certain pattern of blue lines so you'll see that if you if you look at this fat rhombus, you'll see that it has a certain pattern of uh, blue uh, line segments, five blue line segments drawn on it, um, and it's the same pattern drawn on all of the fat rhombi in, in the tiling. And similarly, uh, if you look at the thin blue rhombus, uh, it has a certain pattern of blue line segments drawn on it, and it's the same same pattern on every thin rhombus. And now we say, okay, now, now the definition of the Penrose tiling is that we can fit these various tiles together, uh, but they, they're only allowed to be next, they're only allowed to be adjacent to one another if the blue lines on one tile join up with the, the, the blue line segments on the neighboring tile to form an unbroken straight line. And so, what you see is that when we then put together a legal Penrose tiling, like the ones we, we have here, it's covered by sets of infinite uh, straight blue lines. So there's an infinite straight blue line, and then there's a whole sequence of parallel infinite uh, blue lines here. And if we focus on any one such set, of parallel blue lines, well, actually, they form nothing but the Fibonacci tiling. So we have a long tile here, and then a short, long, long, short, long, short, long. Now, actually, there's five sets of such blue lines corresponding uh, parallel to the five edges of a regular pentagon in this tiling. Um, and so you see the Amon lines sort of decompose the Penrose tiling into a superposition of five 1D Fibonacci tilings. Um, another nice way to think about what the, what, what the Amon lines are doing um, is that, you know, if you think of the Penrose tiling, if you think of all the purple edges as being half silvered mirrors, uh, so, and you think of the blue line as being a laser beam, so I have a little laser pointer, so suppose I stand right here with a laser pointer and I turn on my laser pointer and I fire it in this direction. Well, it hits this half silvered purple mirror. And so half of it goes through, half of it gets reflected this way. And then, uh, you know, it, it, it gets to this mirror. And again, half of it goes through, half of it gets reflected down. And it, if you just follow it through, it's just one, 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 one observer standing at one point in the, in the, in the tiling who turns on their laser pointer uh, generates the entire uh, pattern of, of, of almond lines drawn here. So it's a kind of very, uh, very, very interesting physical interpretation of what's what's going on, or elegant, elegant interpretation, let's put it that way. Um, okay, so so much for the definition of the Penrose tiling. What does it have to do with physics? Well, so the first point to say is that uh, there's already one famous application uh, that, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, when physicists want to know what, what, what a hunk of matter looks like on the microscopic scale, one of their favorite tools is Bragg diffraction. So they take their, their hunk of matter here and they, 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 they fire a, a beam of uh, particles, let's say x-rays, uh, at the hunk. And, uh, uh, and then 
and then they look the 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 the, the particles pass through the hunk and 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 then uh, and then uh, hit a detecting plate on the other side. And you know if this was a ball of gas or a ball of liquid, then uh, then the beam would come through and would be spread out into a kind of blob on the screen with no particular structure. Um, but instead, if it's a crystal, you see something very different. The, 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 the beam ends up being making bright spots at, at various discrete points on the, um, on the, on the screen. Um, uh, and so traditionally, that was the, that was the sign of a, of a, of a, that, that you had a hunk of a crystalline matter. Um, but, uh, then what was discovered in 1984 by Daniel Schechtman was that there were hunks of matter where if you, um, if you, if you, if you shined x-rays at them, you would get a diffraction pattern like this, where, uh, where if you count the number of uh, dots in a circle here, it turns out to be 10. So in other words, this is a pattern. This is a, this is the sort of pattern that you would get if you if you if there were some axis of symmetry in your quote unquote crystal uh, that has uh, that 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 is an axis of five or tenfold rotational symmetry. But we saw on one of the first slides that there's a theorem that that's impossible. So uh, people realized that th this this sort of uh, object that they were finding was uh, couldn't be a, couldn't be an ordinary crystal with translational symmetry, and instead is a new type of material now called a quasi crystal, uh, for which the Penrose tiling essentially uh, provides the mathematical blueprint. It's maybe a three dimensional analog of the of the Penrose tiling. Okay, so that's the application so far to quasi crystals in the lab. But I mean, something that I I and probably others have been interested in for a long time is that. Well, you know, the reason that people were so interested in the Penrose tiling starting from the 1970s, the reason that so many great mathematicians got interested in it was because it has all of these very beautiful properties that fit together in very remarkable ways. And very, and, uh, and this application to quasi crystals in the lab, in a sense, it doesn't really make use of, of, of there, there's a lot of those properties that somehow just don't, don't, don't really play a role there. Like in particular, uh, the, the tiling has a sort of uh, very fundamental sort of uh, invariance under rescaling, a bit like a fractal, um, and that that doesn't really play a role in this uh, in this in this quasi first initial quasi crystal application. Um, so it's interesting to think about what are the other you know beautiful things like to find a home in the world, and uh, it's interesting to think about where else the quasi crystal wants to uh where, where else the penrose tiling and its cousins want to um appear in 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 in, in, in uh in, in the real world okay well so as i just mentioned uh there's one application that that i i i i, I that will not be the main focus of this talk but i did want to mention quickly which uh i think should be important um and uh and uh, I had a paper about this a couple of years ago, uh, but uh, you know, there's a sense in which uh, the Penrose tiling has a kind of discrete version of scale invariance that an ordinary uh, periodic tiling doesn't have. An ordinary periodic tiling has a kind of discrete version of translational invariance, but no, but 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 no, but no scale invariance. And uh, in the Penrose tiling, it's kind of the reverse, and uh, so. You know, it's it's it routinely when if we have a trans translationally invariant system, um, it either maybe it spontaneously forms a lattice, a periodic lattice, uh, uh, like a crystal, um, or we, for practical purposes, turn it into a lattice for the purpose of studying it more easily with pencil and paper or putting it on a computer. And the reason that that lattices appear in that context is because somehow the fundamental symmetry, the the most important symmetry, maybe in the system, is translational symmetry, and the lattice. Well, it doesn't preserve all of the original continuous translational symmetry, but it at least preserves an infinite discrete subgroup of that translational symmetry. Um, so, you might expect that a Penrose tiling 
should play a similar role when uh continue when 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 uh conformal symmetry or scale invariance is the most important symmetry that uh yeah that 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 that, that if you want to if you want to preserve an infinite discrete subgroup of the group of scale transformations um find some discrete structure that uh that 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 does that then the penrose then it's really the penrose tiling you want not an ordinary not an ordinary lattice um and so i've just tried to uh to to give a to give a kind of a cartoon well not a cartoon uh, to get the, i think the easiest way to see that the penrose tiling knows something non-trivial about scale invariance that an ordinary lattice does not uh is 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 supposed to be shown by this this picture. So so here I've drawn here I've superposed you know two different uh, versions of the square tiling. So there's the pink square tiling with the larger squares, and then of course I can I can just go go to each pink square and subdivide it into four black squares. And in that way, that's like a quote unquote. You might say that's like an inflation rule where I've where I replaced the pink square tiling. By a more refined um, uh, black square tiling that, for all intents and purposes, is just an equivalent uh, rescaled version of the original guy. Um, so, what's the big deal? Doesn't 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 uh, doesn't an ordinary doesn't the square tiling therefore have just as much of an inflation rule as the Penrose tiling does? Well, no. The problem is that. Uh, that it's it's okay it's okay to go in this direction to start from the pink tiling and 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 perform inflation i.e. refine it to the more refined uh, black square tiling but the problem is when you want to go in reverse that uh, that the inverse process deflation going from the more refined black tiling to a more to a tiling with larger squares um, is not locally unambiguous so I've, I, I in the cartoon here you know i've plunked down four different construction workers at different points on the tiling and let's say they're all instructed to start putting black squares four black squares together to make a larger square well the the, the pink construction worker might might do it this way and the orange guy might do it this way and the green guy might do it this way and the blue guy might do it this way and you see that as they grow, as they grow their patches, you know they're they're going to run into each other and 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 conflict with one another because already even after one level of deflation, there's already a fourfold ambiguity in how um, how to how to um, uh, so domain walls will form because there's there's already a fourfold ambiguity, and then if you wanted to go two steps, there would be a sixteenfold ambiguity, and the the ambiguity in how what coarse grained lattice this this black tiling came from grows exponentially with the number of uh with the number of steps of coarse graining you want to do so that the black tiling and it, as an intrinsic property of it having translational invariance it has to forget which more which 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 more coarse grained tiling it came from um so here I've shown two examples of the, the so here the here for example the blue and pink square tilings are two different large two different coarse grain tilings that both both yield the um, black tiling so there's there's already at this level there's 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 sixteen different uh, such tilings to choose from so the black tiling forgets which tiling it came from not so with the Penrose tiling though so so here. Uh, here I've shown, you know, the, the 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 purple tiling is one level of the Penrose tiling, and then I can perform the inflation operation. So the inflation operation produces the pink tiles here, which are again just uh, another version of the Penrose tiling, but just scaled down by the golden ratio. And again, I can just locally do this. There's a locally unambiguous way to do this by going to each tile, each purple tile, and cutting it up into pink tiles in a certain way that that I explained. On an earlier slide, but now there's a key difference, which is that also if I just give you the pink tiling, you can go backwards, and there's an unambiguous way to reconstruct locally unambiguous way to reconstruct the purple tiling from the pink tiling uh, by gluing by gluing uh, uh, pink tiles together to make purple tiles. So, although at first glance it looks like the purple tiling has a has a scale in it, it looks like all the edges have a certain length. 
Secretly, it does not have a scale. Secretly, it's it's equivalent to every 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 level of more refined tiling, like the pink tiling, or more coarse grain tiling, that 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 that, that, that live that live above above and below it, uh, uh, and, but that are all secretly equivalent by these inflation and deflation rules. Ah. Uh, Okay, and so this uh, this actually comes up in the context of, uh, of of holography. I had a paper a couple of years ago uh, with uh, Madeline Dickens and Felix Flicker, um, where okay, so just very briefly, what I'm showing here is uh, is that uh, if, yeah, if you if you think about regular tilings. Of the two-dimensional sphere, well, those are the. Oops, my computer is going to run out of batteries. Let me plug it in. So. Okay, sorry about that. Um. So yeah, so 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 if you look at different possible tilings of the sphere, well, there's five of them uh, into of the two-dimensional sphere, the the platonic, the five platonic solids, and then if you ask for what are the different regular tilings of the plane, well, there's three of those: the square tiling, the triangular tiling, and the hexagonal tiling. Um, and then, but then there are also maybe less familiarly familiarly, I can't say it. You may be less familiar with the tilings of, uh, of, of 2D hyperbolic space, but there's an infinite number of those, too, where you can do things like having uh, three, hep three septagons meet at every, at every vertex or, uh, or four pentagons meet at every uh, uh, vertex. And uh, uh, to make a long story short, uh, what we... Uh, there's this holographic duality that's supposed to relate quantum gravity in negatively curved space times to a theory with scale invariance on the boundary of that space time. And about 10 years ago, there were these inter there was this interesting paper by uh, Ostowski and Yoshida and collaborators, the so-called happy paper, who proposed a kind of uh, nice way of discretizing that um, Trying to trying to kind of uh, make a discrete toy model of that duality that respects a lot of the symmetry in the in the hyperbolic space by replacing it by a very symmetrical tiling, like one of these tilings at the bottom. Um, and uh, so, uh, what, what 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 we pointed out in this paper is that actually, whenever you discretize hyperbolic space in that way, in a way that respects a lot. Uh, an infinitely large discrete subgroup of its isometry group, that actually that discretization can be broken into shells where as the shells approach the boundary, it's, they basically form a stack of these Penrose-like ti Penrose tilings that are all aperiodic tilings that are all related to one another by inflation and deflation as you get out to the boundary. And so indeed, it confirms this fact that that if you take a theory on the boundary that has scale invariance, it kind of naturally wants to live on a Penrose tiling. And uh, anyway, it seems to it seems to agree with that with that with that intuition. But so that brings me to the main um, application I wanted to tell you about today. That that that, that this uh, uh, a second um, another uh, application of the Penrose tiling is that it turns out to be. Uh, turns out to basically be a quantum error correcting code in the sense that I'll describe in a moment. Oops, sorry. Again, my computer is not charging properly. I apologize. One moment. Um, okay, so, uh, uh, yeah, so what's the idea in brief? Well, I want to use two key properties of the Penrose tiling here. Okay, I want to basically on this slide. This is in a nutshell why you should why why you should see that there's a connection between Penrose tilings on the one hand and quantum error correcting codes on the other. 
uh, it's because the, the following concept appears analogously in both in both uh, cases, and then I'll then I'll explain how you make how you make uh, how you actually show the show the equivalence in detail. So, what are the two properties on the Penrose side? Well, the first property is what I call recoverability R. So that's if you take any finite region of the Penrose tiling and you erase it, and I only give you the complement. So if it, suppose I suppose I take any finite region K and I erase it. And so you're only left with the complementary region KC of the tiling outside of the finite region K. Uh, then the first point is that you can uniquely reconstruct what the tiling was in the finite region K. You can see that easily from the Amund lines. You just extend the Amund lines in KC uh, back into K. Um, and then the almond lines, you can convince yourself, are just dual to the purple Penrose tiles. If you, once I tell you where the almond lines are, you can figure out where the purple uh, purple lines are. So you can reconstruct the Penrose tiling in K from the Penrose tiling in, in the complementary region KC. The second key property is local indistinguishability, which I call I. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to I'm going to abbreviate these two properties as R and I later. Uh, Again, I is the property I mentioned before that that uh, that although there are actually an infinite number of globally distinct Penrose tilings, they're locally indistinguishable in the sense that any finite patch that appears in any one Penrose tiling uh, also appears uh, in in any other finite in, in any other Penrose tiling, no matter how large that patch is. Um, and moreover, actually, they appear with the same frequency in all in all the tilings. Um, okay, so what about what about quantum error correcting codes? What about the right-hand side of this diagram? Well, first of all, very briefly, what is a quantum error correcting code? So a classical error correcting code is a code where I, I, I have certain uh, words that I want to send over a channel. Um, but I, I, I redundantly encode them into uh, I, I encode them with some redundancy so that even if the channel is noisy, the uh, person on the other end of the channel can can recover the words I actually wanted to uh, send them uh, if I if I if I used enough and clever enough redundancy in encoding them. Uh, so quantum error correcting code is like that. Um, so we're going to take now we want to take the quantum information that we want to store in, let's say, our quantum computer, some state that we want to that we want the quantum computer to manipulate. Uh, we we're going to protect that by 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 encoding it with some clever sort of redundancy. Um, and so how does that work? Well, the idea is that the state, the actual state that we want, the that we want to manipulate the the, the logical state. Um, we're going to embed that in some code subspace C of the larger quantum Hilbert space H. And we call it a quantum error correcting code if that, if that embedding has the special property that if we now take any finite region, well, not any, suppose we, suppose we, suppose we choose some finite region K, okay, and the, the Hilbert space has the property that it can be expressed as the tensor product of the Hilbert space of the degrees of freedom living inside the region K and the Hilbert space H sub KC of the, of the degrees of freedom living outside K and the complementary region KC. Then we say it's a quantum error correcting code if, if, it, has a pro if it has the property that uh, if I construct the reduced density matrix, um, in the finite region K, um, that the reduced density matrix in that region is independent of what state I chose in the, in the code space C. That, that is saying that, that, that an observer or the, the environment as long as it is restricted to only looking at the finite region K can learn nothing about what state, what actual state uh, in the code space C 
I'm, I'm, I'm using. And therefore, therefore, uh, that, 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 that's the, that's the, that's the fundamental property that you need in order to be a quantum error correcting code. Um, so at the level, uh, so, so, so to, to say it in a bit more, uh, to say it in equations, okay, the idea is that quantum error correcting code, uh, well, we have our full Hilbert space H, the, the, Hilbert, the Hilbert space with redundancy, if you want. And when we split the, uh, the space into a, when we split actual geometric space, let's say the two-dimensional Euclidean plane that our quantum computer lives on, uh, into the finite region K and the complementary region K complement, that the, t the, the, the Hilbert space breaks up as the tensor product of the Hilbert spaces on those two regions. And then again, we have our code subspace C, which is a subspace of the larger Hilbert space H. Uh, and uh, let's say we have a basis, psi i, psi I the psi i are a basis for C, the code space. Let psi denote any vector in C, okay, just an arbitrary linear combination of the basis elements for, for the for the code subspace C. Uh, and I, this is, I'm just saying, I'm taking it to be normalized here. Um, so then, yeah, I, just to repeat what I said before, we say that the embedding of the subspace C into the larger Hilbert space H is a quantum error correcting code for arbitrary errors or erasures in K, if the reduced density matrix in K, in other words, this would be the full density matrix of the state psi. If we took any state psi in the Hilbert space C, in the code space C, but now we take its pure state, we take this pure state and we trace out the Hilbert space in the complementary region K sub C to get the reduced density matrix. That's the definition of the reduced density matrix in K. So rho sub k is, captures everything we can know about the state psi if we only are allowed to do observations in the region k. So if rho sub k is independent of what state psi we chose in C, then that's, that's what we mean by a quantum error correcting code. Uh, because again, the idea is that is that if the environment now cannot learn anything about which state in the code space we're working with by just examining uh, uh, fi that finite region K, it also cannot destroy the information about the, about the region, uh, about, the, about the state psi by anything it does, any, any error or, or, or erasure of the information in the Hilbert space that is restricted to the Hilbert space in the finite region K. And uh, so this, this condition here is just equivalent. It's a short exercise to show that that's just equivalent to the statement that the statement that I actually am going to want to uh, check uh, on the next slide that uh, uh, that, 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 that the trace over the Hilbert space in, in, in K complement of, of uh, any two basis vectors, psi, uh, psi i, psi j, is proportional to this density matrix, which again is state independent and only depends on the geometry of the finite region K. Uh, so, so if this condition is, is satisfied, we say that we have a quantum error correcting code capable of correcting arbitrary errors in the region K. And what I'm going to show on the next slide is that actually from the Penrose tiling, the Penrose tiling naturally gives such a code where one can construct, it gives a quantum error correcting code capable of correcting errors in any finite region K. So how does that work? Um, okay, so for each tiling T, for each Penrose tiling T, I'm going to uh, regard that as a state in my larger Hilbert space H. And uh, if I have two tilings, two such tilings, well, if they're distinguishable 
I, 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 they, they, they should be or they should be represented by orthogonal states. So if there are any two different tilings, that means I can distinguish them. Uh, so their their inner product is zero. On the other hand, they're normalized. If it's if t is equal to t prime, then then the, then the norm is one. Okay. So now, so in particular, note that let let let, let g t denote the translation of the tiling, the original tiling T by some translation G, or more generally by some, actually by, by any, any Euclidean isometry. So it can be a combination of rotations and ref, uh, translations and rotations actually. Um, okay, so then I wanna define the equivalence class T den denoted by T brackets as the set of all tilings T twiddle that are related to the tiling T by some Euclidean isometry G, okay? So in other words, there's there's there, there's there, there are two different tilings where I can lot them up so that they perfectly overlap. Those are in the same equivalence class, whereas two different tilings where I cannot do that, I can only get them to agree over arbitrarily large finite regions, but not everywhere. Those are in different equivalence classes. Okay, and then for each equivalence class, T bracket, I define this state, which is just the superposition of all tilings in the equivalence class. And the main claim here is that these states, psi sub T bracket, uh, are indeed a basis. They do define a basis uh, for a subspace C of the full Hilbert space H, which is indeed a quantum error correcting code capable of correcting errors in any finite region K, okay? So to prove that, we just need to check that this condition on the previous slide is satisfied. And so in particular, in this context, it means we need to prove, we need to check two different things. We need to check that this quantity, when T is equal to T prime, when, when the equivalence classes are the same, uh, is equal to this, well, let me, I said it backwards. When the, when, when the, when the equivalence classes are not the same, we want this, we want the, we want this quantity to evaluate to zero. Okay. When they're not the same, that's condition one. And then when they are the same, we want them to evaluate. We want the result to be proportional to a density matrix that is independent of the equivalence class T and only depends on the geometry of the finite region K. That's condition two. And uh, so here, that's it's that's what I that's what I prove on this slide. I actually I think in view of time, I may not go through the proof in detail. I'll just emphasize it's it's it, it, hopefully the short the fact that it all fits on one slide shows that it's it's actually uh, not a difficult uh, thing to check. Um, but uh, nevertheless, it, it takes uh, it, it's better. To, let me suggest that if you if you're interested in the proof uh, uh, to look at it in our to read it in our paper. I, for now, I just want to mention two things about it. That to prove condition one, I end up having to use the first condition about the Penrose tiling, uh, the, the recoverability condition R. And that to prove condition two, I end up having to use that recoverability property and also the local indistinguishability property. By the way, I, I keep saying I, but of course I mean we, my collaborator Joe and I. Um, uh, Yes. So, so just to just to just to quickly go back to the picture and emphasize. So there, I I I think I I think I I I emphasized that. Uh, I, I think I forgot to uh, mention when I was introducing the quantum error correcting code on this slide, what was analogous about it. Uh, and uh, so I'm doing things a little bit out of order here, but I mentioned these two properties of the Penrose tiling: recoverability and indistinguishability. Well, what about on the quantum error correcting code side? What, what is the analogous feature? Well, on the one hand, we want it to be the case that, that uh, if noise or the environment comes in and erases uh, or creates some arbitrary errors in the finite region K of our Hilbert space, uh, that we can recover uh, the, the 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 disrupted information in that region just based on the information that remains in the is contained in the exterior hilbert space in the complementary region kc 
That is analogous to property one here, that if we erased the finite region of the tiling, we want to be able to recover it from the complementary region. Um, on the other hand, as mentioned before, the defining property of the quantum error correcting code, a necessary and sufficient condition for, to have a quantum error correcting code is that if I am restricted to make if I am restricted to make measurements purely in the finite region K, that tells me nothing, provides no information about which state in the code space C that I'm in. That is analogous to property two here, that just looking at, at any finite region of the Penrose tiling tells me nothing about which global Penrose tiling I'm actually in. Okay, and so, what we've just seen is that, indeed, uh, that really that 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 parallel really does hold water. So that so that indeed it does turn out that it's it doesn't they don't just sort of smell sim similar. Uh, it is really the case that the quantum error correcting con con code conditions one and two, the two conditions we needed to check in order to prove that we had a quantum error correcting code. Uh, do indeed follow from from the two properties R and I of the Penrose tiling. Uh, so I just wanted to end with a few. I see I'm I'm five minutes from the end here, so I just wanted to end with some uh, with some with a few remarks about this uh, result. So first, uh, this quantum error correcting code is very unlike uh, previous the, the famous previous codes. Um, including the toric code, the surface code, the color code, the ha code. Uh, for one thing, it's not a stabilizer code. It's not, not part of the state, doesn't fall within the stabilizer formalism. And also, we also prove in our paper that, uh, so whereas usually uh, quantum error correcting code, the way, the way they usually arise uh, is uh, as the ground state space of some local Hamiltonian. In fact, this is why quantum error correcting codes have become very important in the fundamental concept and the idea of topological order in condensed matter physics. Topologically ordered state, non-trivially -trivial, topological ordered state uh, will have a whole infinite subspace of degenerate ground states. And those that subspace is a code space C within the larger Hilbert space of states of that system. Um, here, uh, our code space uh, cannot. Uh, we, 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 I, I, I'll have to leave the argument. Uh, I'll have to refer you to the paper for the argument. But C cannot be the ground state of any local Hamiltonian. Um, next, uh, I wanted to mention some hints that might make one suspect that maybe this 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 quantum error correcting code provides a model for how the quantum gravity microstates underlying a classical spacetime. Uh, relate to or encode that spacetime. So the first hint is from holography. A uh, paper from almost 10 years ago now uh, argued that, that the holographic duality, the ADS-CFT correspondence, is itself a kind of quantum error correcting code. On the other hand, um, as I mentioned before, uh, the, the happy paper had this nice idea of, of of discretizing the bulk hyperbolic space in a in a particular in, in, in a way that preserves a lot of symmetry, and then we had the follow this this paper pointing out that when you do that, you end up basically breaking the the hyperbolic space into a stack of of of, of Penrose tilings. So there's already this hint that quantum error correcting codes and uh, and and, and, and uh, Penrose tilings are, are are connected. They, they they both appear in this holographic context, adjacent to one another, if you will. Um, now uh, here, uh, a second point is that well, so if you think about, suppose you ask yourself, okay, suppose suppose I where suppose I where should I where is the where is the Penrose tiling microstate? actually located in space-time. Well, you know, according to, the, according to the principle of general covariance, the only way I can tell, you know, the only way I can tell the difference, the only way I can observationally distinguish between the tiling T 
and, and the tiling GT, in other words, the same tiling which has just been acted on by some Euclidean isometry, is if there is some absolute reference frame established in space-time that can tell me, okay, this, this tiling, such and such a feature is sitting at the origin, whereas at, at this tiling, it's, it's, it's displaced from the origin along the X direction or something like that. But, you know, the basic idea of general covariance is that space-time has no such absolute reference frames, um, that that's mathematically encoded in the principle of diff invariance. Um, so the only diff invariant microstate I can, I, the only diff invariant answer I can give is that the, 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 the Penrose tiling isn't here or here. It, it has to be in a superposition of all different uh, ways I could situate it in the space. Um, but those are exactly our code states. Okay, so the, the only diff invariant uh, uh, states, uh, uh, if you want to think about these tilings as microstates for the spacetime, are, are precisely superpositions of all different ways of, of embedding them in the spacetime, which are exactly what our code states are. Um, so it su suggests that the, that the code space is, is, is precisely the, 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 the diff invariant subspace of the larger Hilbert space. Um, and then uh, there's, I didn't get a chance to explain this point, but uh, it's, 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 it's described in the, dis in the uh, discussion section of our paper, if you're interested. There's actually an infinite ambiguity about how to embed the code space C in the Hilbert space H. Uh, in other words, there's, 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 there's an infinite phase ambiguity about, I need to take a, a superposition of all, uh, all different ways of embedding the tiling within the space time to get a code space. State, but with what phases? Well, it turns out you can pick those phases arbitrarily, but you, in each way, you get a different code subspace. You get a different inequivalent uh, embedding of the code space C in the larger Hilbert space H. That seems to reflect the infinite ambiguity about how to define the zero particle state in a given spacetime in quantum gravity. That's famously the, the fact that there, on a given spacetime, there's many different quantum states that different observers would call the, one observer might call this one the zero particle state and that, that state full of, full of particles, whereas another observer might, might say the opposite. That's, that's this famous effect in quantum field theory and curved spacetime uh, that's responsible, for example, for the phenomenon of Hawking radiation from a black hole, or one way to understand the phenomenon of Hawking radiation in any case. Um, then, uh, sorry, I know I'm running out of time here. Uh, uh, I wanted to say that uh, from the yes, discussion... You can so take some time. You can take some time. No worries. Okay. I think I'm just... I'm a couple minutes from the end. Uh, I'm almost there. Um, this is the last slide. Uh, so the, the Penrose code that I described, the one built from the Penrose tiling itself, it, it really wants, it, it needs, it has to live in infinite continuous two-dimensional Euclidean space, okay? It, it really cannot abide being in any finite space. It doesn't make sense when you try to put it in any finite space. But interestingly, other tilings are different. Uh, so there's a close cousin of the Penrose tiling. The Penrose tiling has tenfold rotational order. A uh, close cousin of the tiling discovered by Amon, the amon binker tiling has eightfold rotational symmetry. Um, also a very beautiful tiling, but is different in subtle ways, even though they're very similar to one another in many respects. So, but in, in any case, the, the Amon binker tiling is another aperiodic tiling with no translational symmetry. So you might think, oh, it, it, it probably can't live in any finite space either. Uh, but no, actually that's not right. In fact, it defines a code, a quantum error correcting code that can live on a finite continuous 2D space, a torus. That's, uh, again, I, re I refer you to our paper for, for, for the construction of how that works. It's very fascinating, I think. And then the 1D Fibonacci code, well, actually, it, it goes even further. It can live on a finite discrete space. Uh, so like, a, for example, a chain of, a chain of spins living on a one-dimensional lattice. Um, and moreover, that, that code can be generalized to, li to live in arbitrary spatial dimension. Um, so yeah, there's, this is maybe a continuation of the previous point about, about, about it may be giving some insight into the relationship between microstates and the macroscopic geometry they correspond to. There's this interesting phenomenon where 
different versions of this code built from different tilings sort of intrinsically generate a space, a certain, this or that space time that they want to live in, or they, they, they pick a space time that they want to live in. Um, uh, and so finally, I'll just end with a, with, 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 with a speculative remark that I hope will connect with the interests of many in the audience here that, uh, that as many of you will know, and that I know, I, I saw, I saw uh, Raymond Ashheim on the call. I know he's been, he's, he's, he's been uh, interested in this idea for many, for, for, for many years, that there's a very beautiful, essentially unique four-dimensional analog of the Penrose tiling called the uh, Elzer Sloan tiling, okay, that was discovered in 1987. Uh, I say it's 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 a very close cousin of the Penrose tiling. I say it's essentially unique. That that there, I'm referring to something that we that we prove uh, first about the lattice, and then about the uniqueness of the space group uh, 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 of, of a tiling with that symmetry in uh, in in four dimensions in these two papers. Um, it has this huge. Symmetry group. So the Penrose tiling has tenfold symmetry. Well, the analog in this tiling is this four-dimensional reflection group called H4, which is Coxeter classified all of the finite reflection groups and divided them into the crystallographic ones, the ones that can live in a periodic lattice, like two, three, four, and six-fold symmetry, but there's also higher dimensional analogs of those symmetries. And then and most of the most of the reflection groups are crystallographic, but then there's a handful of non-crystallographic ones. There's, there's, actually, there's an infinite number in two dimensions: five-fold symmetry, seven, eight, anything that's not two, three, four, or six. But then in three dimensions, there's one more: the icosahedral group. And in four dimensions, there's one more: H four, which is basically like the four-dimensional analog of the icosahedral group. Um, so it's the biggest possible uh, 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 non-crystallographic symmetry group. It's the highest dimension that that, that you can find such a group is four dimensions, um, and, uh, and 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 this Elzer Sloan quasi crystal is essentially the unique cousin of the Penrose tiling corresponding that that, that embodies that 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 non-crystallographic symmetry group. Every every analog of the Penrose tiling, uh, every cousin of the Penrose tiling, uh, its aperiodicity is is sort of a uh, forced upon it by the fact that it it has it embodies one of these non-crystallographic symmetry groups. So that the Elzer Sloan is, is this 4D quasi-crystal that that is the biggest and most symmetric example of this phenomenon. Um, so uh, meanwhile this 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 Elzer Sloan tiling uh, with its with its spectacular symmetry, uh, well how where does it come from? Well it's obtained as a maximally symmetric splitting or slicing of the eight-dimensional E8 root lattice into two orthogonal 4D slices. So it's, it's, it, it, it has this very fundamental connection with E8. And needless to say, I don't need to tell this audience that that means it's all very closely connected to the octonians um, uh, because the E8 is the lattice of integers in the octonians and owes its existence to the octonians by the magic square construction. Um, and, uh, so yeah, it's, 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 it's just, it's, of course, it's irresistible to think, to, to ask whether, whether, uh, whether, uh, the analogous quantum error correcting code, you know, an analogy to the quantum error correcting code I, I just built in 2D using the Penrose tiling, uh, whether the analogous code built from the 4D Elzer Sloan quasi-crystal has something to do with the 4D uh, space time that we live in, or the Euclidean version of that, on which maybe uh, maybe uh, the path integral is better defined, um, and uh, the fact that it comes from this 8D space that's split up into two 4D orthogonal slices in this very uh, symmetric uh, way, uh, it's natural to wonder whether that's related to the two-sheeted CPT symmetric universe uh, construction that, that my collaborator Neil Turek and I have been interested in for the past few years uh, for cosmological reasons um, and uh, due to the, and, and, and connected to the standard model, the structure of the standard model, because as we've heard as many, in many talks in, in the in this series, uh, the standard model does have a whole lot of intriguing uh, relationships to the E8 and the Octonians. And so Maybe this is a part of that story. So, so um, 
uh, anyway, okay, that's that's all I wanted to say. So 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 thanks thanks very much uh, for listening, and um, yeah, happy to take questions. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Latham. That was fascinating, beautiful talk. Lots of new things happening here. So thanks once again. So please, uh, the talk is open for questions. I think there's quite a few of you are experts on dialings and error correcting codes. So good to have a learned audience with us. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, when, yeah, please. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, okay. the question, yes. They also points in the chats. If you have mentioned something in the chat, please feel free to go ahead with the question. Yeah, Daniel. Yes. Please. Um, very Please beautiful that. talk, and uh, I was wondering if there, uh, if you're aware of a theoretical result. I mean, given a finite region of the Penrose styling, if there is uh, some kind of constraint on what are the least stylings needed to recover the whole region. So, oh uh, yeah. You mean you mean you mean the reverse of the project, the, the reverse of the property I mentioned. So yes, I, I was exactly. saying that I was saying that if if you take a finite region K and its complementary region KC, that if I tell you the tiling in KC, can you recover the the tiling in K? And the answer there is always yes. Uh, you uniquely can. Uh, now, on the other hand, if you take the reverse problem, if I give you the finite region K, exactly. you might ask: Is there any finite region that's big enough that you could uniquely recover? The full tiling in KC. The answer is no, because yes. that that follows by local indistinguishability. Because it, any any finite region, no matter how large, can appear in any of the tiling. Exactly, but in case of a finite region, so mm -hmm. if we restrict ourselves in a finite region, uh, right. I am sure that there is, uh, uh, yeah, there is a, a finite a, a, a small number of uh, of tiles that will allow to reconstruct the whole finite region. I'm not sure if there is uh, a theoretical result on this. So that uh, maybe- Yeah, I that's another know. interesting, that indeed, that is, a, in, that is an interesting and harder problem. That's this problem of empires. Yes, that there exactly. is indeed there, there is indeed this, this, this issue that, uh, I mean, a funny thing about one of the fascinating properties of the Penrose tiling is although it's, it's not, it's, it has no periodicity, it is somehow, perfectly ordered, just like a perfectly periodic tiling. Uh, and so, uh, indeed, yeah. finite patches, a certain finite fix, once restricting a certain finite patch can have, can restrict yeah, it would other, force regions, the other regions of the tiling in very counterintuitive ways. Um, I don't know what the general result is there. I mean, I have been interested in that problem. It, exactly the problem you say. I would love to know the answer. With so <laughs> in, as I say, in the, in the case of the in the case of, the, of course, I'd love to know it for any of these tilings. But it particularly is of importance in the case of the Amon Binker tiling, or or basically any of these other tilings. You know, it turns out the tenfold Penrose tiling. As I say, it really has to live in infinite. 2D space. There's a theorem that if you try to put it on any finite compact space like a torus, it always has to have at least two defects, uh, local defects. Um, but the 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 Amon Binker tiling is not that way, and nor is the 12-fold uh, tiling. They both can live on finite spaces. Um, and in that case, yeah, your question becomes a very relevant one uh, in terms of how exactly how good exactly what errors can and cannot be corrected by those by those by those finite versions of those tilings because you know you might say that for a finite if you want to in, in put one of these tilings on a finite quantum computer you know if you wanted to actually use these for practical purposes well the, probably the penrose tiling one is not going to be so practical because you would need an infinitely large quantum computer to put it on but the Amon beaker tiling uh you maybe could build a build, make make practically implement a quantum code based on that one, but of course, then if it lives on a finite space, it's no longer going to be able to correct errors in an arbitrarily large yeah. uh, in an arbitrarily large finite region. There's going to be it's going to only be able to correct errors in finite regions up to some size and shape. And in our paper, we prove 
for our Amon Binker code, for the Amon Binker code, we prove a size up to which it can correct errors, but we do not claim that that proof is as strong as it could be. So in other words, huh. it could be that it, it could be that the code can correct even larger errors than the ones that we proved it could correct. But to answer exactly what errors, exactly how big an error it can correct, how big an error region it can it can correct, um, how big the region K can be, one needs to answer the question that you're 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 asking, and I, I don't I don't think people know the answer to that. Um, Lee, in that case. Uh, uh, Leith, um, uh, this is Klee with Quantum Gravity Research. Yes. Um, maybe Hi. Um, hi. Um, maybe Fong or someone else from our group on this call could uh, paste one of our papers on the empire problem, because I agree with you uh, mm -hmm. that this is a deep problem and it relates to the empire problem. So we've yes. got... Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. We'll paste that. Fong, if you're hearing this, um, maybe you could paste that for everybody. That would be great. And actually, maybe if you could just, I, I'm, I'm a little bit worried I'm going to forget to see it in the chat. Uh, and uh, so if you could maybe just also email it to me, that would be also also you, great. You got it. So sorry to interject. Uh, there is a friend from Quantum Gravity Research was left a comment, a very interesting work. Let him, I think that's related to this empire construction. Could you please uh, say out your comment, QGR? I'm sorry, is what's my, the question? What's the question? Is that my uh, comment? Oh, yeah, if we could um paste that, I think he might be asking. Yeah, I paste the paper of the non-local game of life uh that used the empire to uh to, as as the guiding principle basically to to drive the dynamics of the of those uh, patches in Penrose County. Like we have a few like legal patches and we we can start it with like a one or like you know like a uh, a few of like a legal um, patches that are legal and then we can use the empire basically to like like how you did the lithium like you extend the amount bars right that's kind of like empire idea except mm -hmm. your emperor is like uh, is is the whole uh, environment so for our case like we have these local patches and these local patches, if you extend their amount bars, that's one of the methods. Or you can cut, use cut and project method, and so then you can you can get this like a force the tiles that the tiles that has to coexist. Have I to see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. By just yeah, by just so extending then, the amount bars out from a finite region. Right. So if you have a few of these patches in a system or many of them, and so then you can use this empire concept hmm. to to forever chase or seek the minimum error in a system. Mm. So that's kind of what we did in a non-local game of life on Penrose Highway. Mm. And so I paste the paper there. I can paste also the paper that Kli asked about the empire. The, I mean- Yes, the and then if you could email those, it, and also don't forget to email those to Latham. Okay. Okay, yeah, thank you. That sounds interesting. Okay. Yeah, very interesting work. Yeah, thank you. Uh, glad yeah, you're nice, out there nice doing this, Latham. I think it's been ten years that you've been focused on on this connection. You know, exploring quasi crystal math for you know utilization in physics. So we're our group is super happy that somebody of your stature is out there sharing this interesting set of problems. So good work. Well, th 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 thanks. And nice to see. Nice to see you all. Yeah, nice yeah. to see you. <laughs> David, go ahead, please. Hey, yeah, thank you. Uh, oh, David, we can't hear you. I think I'm having... Yeah. Oh, no. One one sec. Uh, we hear you now. Oh, you can hear me now? Yes. Yeah, we hear you. Please go ahead. Okay, hey. Hey, thanks for the, the wonderful talk, by the way. Um, I, I wanted to ask a question, just to kind of double-check my understanding um, about how to use these positives for... Let's say we were trying to actually build a quantum computer. So the Hilbert space, as I understand, it's the it's the, in the tiling space itself. So it's like the different states are the different tiles them tilings themselves. Is that is that correct? Right. And then so in other words, like we're essentially going to need control over the quasi-crystal tiling itself in order 
like if we were going to build a quantum computer, it's like control over how to try to manipulate the closet. Right? Is that the idea? I'm having a little trouble hearing you, but yes, but that's a good that's a good question and good point. So let me make a I, I should have commented about that. Yeah. So um, in, in terms of the question of practicality, uh, yeah, the the um, it does indeed. Uh, uh, so I'm I'm very struck I, by by we're, I think we're very struck by the mathematical fact that that the Penrose tiling sort of in a way kind of uh, you know knew about quantum error correcting codes before quantum gravity was before quantum uh, computation was invented, um, but uh, indeed the, the actual state that the the actual code that we construct. You know, ne never, never, never underestimate, uh, never underestimate uh, the cleverness of experimentalists. But, uh, you know, in my naive way of conceiving it, it does have this kind of Schrodinger's cat type of property that the different code states seem very Schrodinger's cat ish because they, they you take these very, you take these infinitely large filings and then you have to superpose different ones of them. Um, so, Probably, if it has some importance, that tiling is more important as a kind of model for or capturing something about, about quantum gravitational microstates in an infinite space, rather than being the kind, kind of code that you want to implement on a computer. Um, there is this very closely analogous code that we describe in our paper, built from the Fibonacci tiling, which is essentially the same code, except because of the different properties of the Fibonacci tiling, you could fit you could put it on just a, a finite circle of spins or 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 uh, uh, or, 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 a tor or a torus uh, uh, you know finite set of spins on a torus. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it th those would be much more uh, I think uh, practical practical codes. And then we actually have another paper coming out. Uh, in preparation, um, Joe and myself and uh, my student Boren Gu about um, a yet more practical code, kind of uh, uh, inspired by inspired by the, by this one, um, but that that would take a little bit of time to explain exactly what the what the idea is there. But but it's indeed. But basically, basically, I think you're quite right, and I probably should have commented on that. And that 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 I you know I don't think that the Penrose tiling code. The one, the 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 the, the, the 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 which has to because it has to live on an infinite space and really involve a continuum, an infinite continuum. Uh, it's probably not a good bet for for a, for 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 a practical quantum computer. Although, um, again, as I say, you never know. I mean, um, but probably you're right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, more comments, questions, please. To follow up on that, I'm so what makes what what makes this quasi crystal quantum mechanical? Like, I, I that's something I'm still confused about. Um, and you know, I should also mention that um, there was a paper that did. A similar thing except using the inflation it used the tiling spaces of the infl from the inflation rule but you're using a uh, translation rotations which probably is actually better um so i mean i've been thinking about this but it still puzzles me because it, it's pretty abstract to just imagine these these ideas of these tilings as elements of a hilbert space um so do you have any like intuition you can kind of share on how did quantum mechanics get into the quantum and closet like at what part of the story do we say, okay, th this is inherently quantum mechanical rather than just mathematical quasi? Well, yes, you're, it's it's true. It's true. It's true that it's true that it's abstract. Yes, uh, the um, uh, you know the uh, it's it's. I think it's 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 it, it's often the case in in the uh, in the quantum error correction community that uh, people think. In these relatively abstract terms about about uh, about trying to construct systems, trying to construct a, a larger state space and a, and a smaller subspace that has this quantum error correcting property. Um, so you know, 
uh, in principle, uh, uh, quantum mechanics describes a- everything. So there's 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 a state, uh, you know, for each for each observably distinct thing, um, and you can ask about how to superpose such states to get to get a to get uh, to get to get an interesting uh, uh, sub a subspace with this interesting property that the quantum info in that subspace is is safe. Um, so. Uh, so you know, uh, 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 every different place, you know, if 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 you if you if you, every different place you could put a Penrose tiling, you could you, every different way you could paint a Penrose tiling onto 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 the infinite plane, you know, is an observably distinct um, configuration of that plane, and so and so it's 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 it is it is okay according to the rules of quantum mechanics to associate a state with that. Um, it is. It is certainly an abstract thing to think about a, a space where that's all there is in that space, uh, which which is kind of the uh, which is which is the, the the model we have in mind here. Um, you know, so that's that's why normally you build such a you build a you have to work very hard to make a quantum computer that's so protected from the environment that that its interior can be described by such a nice model or or else you have to take the perspective which i think is probably more likely here that that really this is maybe a kind of model for the actual again still probably a toy model but that that it maybe captures something about about the about the way that the microstates under underlying space time relate to that space time so in that in that from that perspective you know 2d or 4d space if you really examined it with the microscope uh Sufficiently good microscope maybe would would be would be a mesh of edges that that, that formed a Penrose tiling, but then if you asked, okay, well, where where exactly is that is that is that mesh of edges sitting in 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 in, in space? The answer is if it's sitting in any one place or another, it's not a diff invariant state, and so the actual diff invariant states are these superpositions of different po- different possible places for it to be. Um, situated so if you if you believe that diff invariance is an exact symmetry of gravity then um then you might say well maybe 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 it's not so crazy to 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 consider such superposition states they're sort of forced upon you Lingtham, um if i could add That's to what you said so um you know i'm interpreting that you have um an open mind in your work to the idea of discrete Hilbert spaces and essentially discrete quantum gravity. Um, the way I look at the inflation rules, you know, is, uh, for example, we can take a lo- a very small section of the Fibonacci chain quasi crystal, where we have only two tiles, one um, equal to one and the other one over the golden ratio. So that's just two tiles. If we want to um, look at that as a as a um, as a post uh, deflated um, larger tile, right of of a larger unit one that's equal to to the full golden ratio one point six, then we realize that we could have um, we could have deflated it on the opposite side. In other words, we can deflate it in a manner that gives us from a long, you know, a long section, we can say we can deflate it with long on the left and short on the right, or alternatively, we are free to deflate it um, with short on the left and long on the right. And when the way we are working some of the math on these uh, simple programs that Fong mentioned is we always um, hold the idea of the of the two or more different ways that you can inflate or deflate uh, <clears throat> as essentially turning the points on or off, right? So if you have a if you have a possibility space mm-hmm. of points as the Penrose tiling at the scale of phi zero, then you can count the number of ways that you can inflate that uh, that finite. Uh, Penrose tiling at the scale of phi one. And so you have all these ways and every way that you can inflate it legally at phi one uh, is equal to a selection of a double digit percentage of the points at phi zero being turned off and a double uh, percentage turned on each a different pattern of on off. But we Mm. have this we have this ontological concept or 
in in our math where where until we choose it okay we consider the superposition of all of the states of on off that's a the interesting interesting idea yeah very good well a uh, really amazing talk. I'm going to, um, is there going to be a recording of this that we can get access to, Latham? Yeah, yeah. It, it's being recorded right now. In a few days, about less than a week, you should have it on the, uh, just Google Osmo 23 playlist. OSM 23 playlist, you will find it. Excellent. Uh, uh, Latham, I wanted to ask you, so there is a competition, I suppose, between environmentally introduced decoherence and the quantum error code. They're competing, right, with each other. Mm -hmm. So how do I describe, like, if the environment is too little, suppose there's no environment, I don't need an error correcting code or need a very small one in some sense. If the environment becomes very drastic, I need a bigger so how do how do I quantify this relative sizes of the environment and the error correcting code? Uh, yeah. So so uh, the uh, the, uh, the that that's a good question. Uh, so you know one thing uh, you can one thing you can uh, people talk about is um, you know. The probability of a of a certain error of a certain size um, uh, uh, per unit time or something like that. Uh, so um, so you know if you so if the um, if your code can only correct errors up to some threshold number or size uh then you need to you know then you and you were trying to make an actual quantum computer then you would have to if you let it run for too long the too many errors would accumulate and the size of region the size of the region that would be corrupted would be too large for your code to handle um mm -hmm. and uh and so you, you it would it would it would tell you that you you know you have to do er the error correction step more frequently um, uh, uh, in order to have the errors, in order to have it likely the case that the errors uh, that, that that happen during that, during mm -hmm. one time step are, are, are small enough that your that your code can correct them. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we, we, we don't, uh, we don't, uh, uh, yeah, and, uh, in our uh, in our code in in the infinite code, you know, we we only we only prove this theorem that for any finite region, no matter how large, that the um, that the that the error can be corrected. Um, uh, so there's a separate question uh, about about uh, if you have an infinite number of errors that are in a, in, a, in, 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 in separate finite regions, so that um, uh, whether no matter how you arrange them, they can still be corrected. Uh, we, 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 we haven't shown that that's true, and I'm not. I don't think I really suspect that that is true. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, and that for the finite code, yeah, that 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 that's that's an that's an important question. So 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 for the finite code, which is the sort of thing you could actually think about putting on a quantum computer, uh, for any of the finite variants, we we prove currently a certain size up to which, if an error happens, uh, it, you know, if 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 if, 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 if a single error happens, uh, 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 affects only a region up to that size, one can correct it. Mm -hmm. um, so, in practically, when one implemented that on a computer, if if the noise was so strong that such such errors of that size were happening frequently, then you would need to be error correcting it very frequently as well. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, why I asked is also probably this is of interest. 
for people doing quantum foundations experiments like in collapse models because they have the same decoherence problem. They want to test whether the wave function collapses spontaneously even if there was no interference from the environment. So clearly to test this uh, new theory, the girardi rimini weber theory, we need to rule out the environmentally induced decoherence and check whether there's a fundamental collapse taking place. So I was wondering if those people also could use these error correcting codes in their experiments. Do you know if they, I've never heard of this being discussed uh, like when I if want to test whether the quantum superposition principle holds for large objects. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to eliminate the environment and then see whether the superposition collapses spontaneously or not. So, that is a good, that's a good question. I, I mean, I, I don't think I have heard about that, but you're right that it does sound like, uh, it does sound like once you implement a computer that can successfully implement a, a, a very effective quantum error correcting code, then you could imagine yeah, I mean, once I, I don't know. Yeah, I, 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 how, how, how will you, how will you distinguish between a, between a, between a, a, a quantum computer where the state collapses due to, due to, due to this collapse model, and one where it collapses because you haven't implemented because there's some noise in your system that you haven't accounted right, for. Right. Absolutely. So if I have a good error correcting code, I keep my experiment clean, so to say. Mm -hmm. Yes, maybe, 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 maybe if there's some very specific prediction about how the collapse takes place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we like that's different. That's different. That's different from quantum mechanics. And if you keep seeing that prediction being fulfilled, then it would be unlikely it was just noise, I guess. But... Okay, so you do think the error correcting code could be helpful in such an experiment? Maybe it sounds like an interesting question yeah. I, I don't uh i'll take it to the quantum foundations people like angelo bussi and group and ask them if they have it looks you promising for because that's what holding them back mm. because and i had mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. question and uh, slightly unrelated it's about your work on the cp symmetric two-sheeted universe is there any way in maybe this is naive? Is there any way in which the other sheet is present in our present universe in some way? Can we experimentally detect the other sheet, or it was long back in the past in some sense? Um, uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, I uh I think of uh, the um, uh, oh, it's just one no. More. It's a good question. I I I I I I have I have I have I have uh, two. I mean, you know, you can always take you can always take this 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 sheet and and and, and fold it up next to the next to the current one. Um, uh, we 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 have these we have these. Uh, pictures sometimes uh, uh, in our in our papers and uh, indeed it's a very interesting question of exactly what is the uh, if there's kind of uh, currently a two sheeted uh, NIST to space time what is the what is the observational um, what is the best way to understand that what's the observational implications of it um, and that's something I've been thinking a lot about um, and I don't uh, I think the answer is I don't. I, you know, that's something that 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 uh, that 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 um, I don't feel completely settled about yet. Although we're 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 working on a paper about about trying trying to think through that uh, that question. Um, I mean, maybe if you think of this the other sheet uh, as a second four D space time uh, kind of thing, which uh, maybe there is some intersection i don't know by the way someone mm -hmm. wrote in the comment that roger wants roger penrose wants to say something i'm so sorry i missed that roger if you're there yes please, i'm here yeah, please go oh. ahead 
Yes, so Roger. Two, two questions, but let's ask the first one first. Um, have you looked at these uh, David Smith Einstein single shape? Uh, no, I haven't yet. I'm very interested to do that. I, you know, I, we, the only they, they, you would be able to make a code with them if they satisfied these two properties: recoverability and local indistinguishability. I, I assume it has the second property. I, I don't know whether it has the first one. Do you happen to know? Well, they're hierarchical, but in a rather subtle way. It's, uh -huh. As far as I can see, it's not quite the same kind of hierarchical nature as the as these my tilings. Um, they're quite subtle. Uh -huh. uh, it would be worth looking at. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anyway, that was just one question. If you haven't looked, <laughs> I waited. Unfortunately, not. Unfortunately, not. Yeah, no. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to look at that and let you know. I mean, I, I, I haven't. I'm sorry. Yes. The other question is quite different, really. It has to do with quasi crystals. And I, I don't know. I really haven't followed the literature up on this issue. But it always struck me that there's, there's an issue. Um, because the assembly has to be non-local. I mean, it has to. In, if you imagine, like, something. I remember. I remember reading about this in your book. Yes, I, I agree. This is a very fascinating question. But go ahead. Yeah, you explain it. I mean, well, I mean, I'm not explaining it. I just wanted. To, it always struck me as there has to be something. It maybe relates to the quantum collapse issue that when you have something big. Um, yeah. That's a that's an interesting question. So just to just to expand upon the question, uh, uh, so there is this famous puzzle about 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 how exactly one succeeds in growing perfect Penrose tilings in the lab because yes. if you make if you make if you try to make Penrose tilings built, if you imagine that they're being assembled because there's some local Hamiltonian that favors, let's say, the seven allowed vertices of the Penrose tiling. And gradually, uh, a little nugget of matter is is accumulating more and more um, uh, tiles according to that rule, more and more atoms according to that rule. Uh, well, if when you try to actually build quantum Penrose tilings on, on the table in that way, just using the matching rules, you, you end up running in before long into contradictions where you have to, you know, yes, well, you have to, to kind of local. backtrack and remove some tiles and then and then place things in a different way. Yes. And so the question is, how does nature manage to do it so much better than the recreational mathematicians uh, 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 do it? And yes. uh, Roger? A fascinating issue, which I, I, I wasn't sure that it had been resolved. And it always struck me as odd. That's yeah. There is one one interesting paper I, I know about that I don't know if you've, if you've seen uh, was a paper in the 80s by... Paul Steinhardt and um, one of, I forget who was the other author, but basically pointing out that um, if you have one of these decapod defects in the tiling, oh, yeah. um, mm -hmm. that uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you kind of assign an arrow charge to the decapod defect, uh, where, you, where you kind of, uh, you know, if, if, you go, if you go around any closed loop in a legal Penrose tiling, I'm saying this for the, for the benefit of the other people on the call, if you if you if you look at the arrows on the edges of the Penrose tiling in the in the in one in, in the kind of one way of presenting the matching rules is to draw arrows on the tiling. If you make any closed circuit, closed loop out of those edges and add up all the arrows with a plus sign or a minus sign as you go around a loop, depending on whether they're pointing in the same way or the opposite way from the orientation of the loop, around any legal patch, any closed loop. In the legal patch of the Penrose tiling, uh, you, the, the arrow charge adds up to zero. But there are these topological defects you can have in the tiling called decapod defects. And if you go around, if you work out the charge around one of those, it's it's uh, non-zero, and it's it can be non-zero, and 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 it's uh, and it's a topological invariant. Um, and if you have one of those defects with a non-zero charge, then it was found numerically. Although I don't know if it's ever been proved that that actually, if you if you take a if you take a start with a finite patch of tiling that just includes one of those defects in the middle, um, and then you you go around the edges and just ask, is there anywhere along the edge where there's a tile? There's the next tile is forced where I don't have a choice. I just have to put this tile or that tile. Uh, you can just make it make a computer code that at every step just rechecks the boundary to find a forced spot and, and the first forced spot it finds it puts a new tile there and then it checks again and it keeps building and 
it, it was found that those that those that when, when you had a defect present that it could grow indefinitely as far as the computer yes. could follow it yes if you make a mistake you can make it the rest of it so it's forced locally yes i think that's true that's probably right yeah 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 um um Anyway, what, that's it. Could you say what you meant about the relation with collapse of the wave function? Could you please say some well, more? This, this is, um, well, I mean, it's a different approach, but I just wondered, uh, I'd have to think back what I was had in mind there. Um, yes, I suppose it, I think that I think that the, the point the point that you made in Emperor's New Mind was that. It, it 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 could you know in the perfect Penrose tiling the fact that if you locally just add one one tile after another you get defects and yet and yet in the lab you seem to get tilings that have that manage to somehow get large yes large true. undefected portions could it be that those large undefected portions were appearing all at once non locally in some sense not 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 locally one yeah. tiling yes, at a time yes. yes there was some suggestion of that sort. Yeah. I, I I think maybe the approach with cut and project might might lead to uh, some interesting result in this uh, uh, in this question. So, because if you um, if you have the quasi crystal from a projection, then clearly um, in the inner space it came it comes from a window and uh, from an acceptance window. So. If you have an inco incompatible uh, tile, uh, this tile or set of tiles or a patch of tiles, these will not remount to the same pre-projected space in the acceptable window, something like that. Uh, I I'm not sure if I made myself clear if it's... Um, so usually um, one can think, for example, in, in this case to A4, and then project and obtain the, the Penrose tiling. And on the other side, you can think of a star map that goes from the physical space to the other inner space, the space mm -hmm. that is projected on the other side in the model set theory. So mm -hmm. in this in this other projection, uh, you essentially have that uh, this point in this quasi-crystal all belongs to a specific acceptance window. So the quasi-crystal formation belongs, uh, remounts from with the st this star map to this specific acceptance window. Hmm. So if we have an, an incompatible uh, set of tilings, like uh, an incompatible patch with another one, if you do this star map and go back into the inner space, you will have that everything, it falls out from the original. Uh, so it's kind of an incompatible acceptance window. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, if... Yeah, that's an interesting point. You think that even uh, even locally, you'll be able to see that that there's that there's some incompatible that there's that. There's... Well, for sure, if you have a local patch and you remount to the uh, to the original, uh, well, to the inner yeah. space of the quasi crystal, you will have a possibility window. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You're so right. You're right. But I, so, so there's a way. There's a way in which that uh, the cut and project already kind of assumes global knowledge of the whole tiling. Mm, I mean, indeed. because so, indeed. so. Um, but you can define see, but the so you're star saying, map. So you're saying it, but you can define the star map, which is the um, the inverse of the project of the projection from the physical space to the lattice space, mm -hmm. combined with the projection from the lattice space to the perpendicular space. The, the composition of this map, which is always possible, uh, is called the star map. Mm -hmm. So the star, to define the star map, you don't need the higher space. You can define it locally. And so defining it locally, you have uh, a way to see if some points belong to this other, uh, to this other uh, acceptance window or not. It's something similar what you have done with the Fibonacci. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So actually, in this case, if you see that a set of points in a quasi-crystal in physical space applying the star map go into different and incompatible, incompatible uh, windows, acceptance windows in the inner space, 
then you have something that is not uh, how do you say it's not possible it's contradictory and uh, and so you you don't have uh, sorry for my english uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's no, no, so no, no 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 problem but, but so so are so are you saying that uh you you should be able it's, you're to saying have, you're saying you're saying you're saying maybe 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 a crystal in the lab could 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 grow itself without running into defects by kind of making use of this star map is yeah that, for example let's take let's take uh let's take the fibonacci fibonacci chain but we can take also the pen, uh, a pen rose like tiling because it's not really but uh where you just do the galois uh uh automorphism where you switch uh phi uh well uh, one uh, plus uh, square root of two you switch mm -hmm. it with uh minus one over phi so you you switch the roots between mm -hmm. the galois field okay mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. this is the usual star map in the fibonacci chain mm -hmm. okay so let's say that you have uh, a specific tiling uh configuration on the fibonacci chain and you mm -hmm. apply this star map which is essentially just a conjugation of the uh, Galois field where you change the the rational part of the of the so in this case you have uh, you uh, you have the, the whole quasi crystal whole the Fibonacci chain quasi crystal just fall into the the window zero one okay mm -hmm. so if you take another configuration and you see and you apply this Galois automorphism and it falls out this this uh this acceptance windows of zero one then you know that is uh, incompatible with the original quasi crystal and it's just you should you should so it's the concept of uh possibility space uh, i mean something like that essentially and uh, I think that it can be done also if we have um, a cut and project way of describing Penrose styling that is, uh, I, I think I've seen it from um, from uh, Baki, Baki, or uh, some something like. But it 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 mm -hmm. was probably with some fault somewhere. But in this case, you should you should be able to to see that a, a configuration of patches, uh, if it falls into the possibility into the acceptance window uh, of another, if the two acceptance windows are incompatible, then uh, the the result would be incoherent, and you can have it locally. Yeah. So mm. it's I have never seen it, but I I think it's really interesting. Uh, uh, Okay. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you yeah, very much. Yeah. Roger, I had a general question for you. From the time you proposed, discovered the tilings till now, so there have been applications, quasi-crystals, error correcting code. Did you see any of this coming? Or did, you <laughs> see, <laughs> did no. it surprise you? No. Well, I wasn't aware of error correcting codes and that sort of idea, so I I wouldn't have made that connection. No, I don't, I don't know. No, lots of things I didn't foresee about it. It's true. <laughs> okay, so at that time it was more mathematical and not thinking in terms of applications. Um, let me just think. Uh, I think I was surprised that people found quasi crystals. You see, because. Um, it's not your question, but um, no, please go ahead. I'm interested. Yeah, the, so the quasi crystal that so I think that was surprising. Well, it was the non locality of the assembly which always worried me, but I guess maybe you can get away by allowing mistakes, that's one way of doing it. Whether mm -hmm. that's what really happens, I'm not sure how precise the actual quasi crystals are. I haven't really followed the literature about these things, so I, I don't know what's been going on. Yeah, There's yeah. actually another point. Uh, the thing about a three-dimensional version of the Aman, well, the three, yes, what was it now? There was a three-dimensional three version introduced by Robert Aman very early on, where he had two, th these are basically um, what rhombohedra, like mm -hmm. rhombuses, but three-dimensional. And there are two of them, 
And there are two versions of each because you have different matching rules. And with those four shapes, you apparently only have non-periodic assemblies. I think for a long time, people didn't really know the answer to that question. I, I don't know what the current view is on those things. I mean, it was Robert Amman very early on produced these. Those, those, those tiles. I, I have heard that too, that they give an aperiodic tiling. I, I, I have never checked that myself. Um, there's there's another, another way to construct those, those, those hired. The, 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 Paul, Paul and I wrote, wrote, uh, had a paper about uh, Paul Steinhardt and I, uh, and 20, I, see. I guess it, it was in 2022, had a paper about how to, Assume that the that the that the, 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 the tiling has 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 uh, has an almond like decoration, but you know instead of one dimensional decorations like you have in two in a two D tiling, you would have two dimensional almond planes in a three D tiling, or or three dimensional almond hyperplanes in a four D tiling, etc. And there you can assume that such a thing exists and construct the almond pattern first and then work backwards to figure out what the tiles are um mm. that way you don't get you don't get his tiles that way so maybe he you gets um but that doesn't mean his tiles aren't aren't better or 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 or, or, or still still correct um i remember uh, v visiting finland somewhere and i saw there was a statue which looked as though it was based on those Aman tiles. I don't know. It, it certainly was uh, huh. made made out of this rhombohedra. But, mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, did did you did you yourself ever interact with with Amin or or meet him? Yes, I did once. Uh, but he was very keen on his idea about the dinosaurs, which you mentioned. <laughs> oh. <laughs> he was yeah. more interested in the dinosaurs, as far as I can make out, than he was in the <laughs> the tilings. <laughs> yes, he was a strange character. Uh -huh. So, more, more, Hillary, you have some comments, please. Would you like to say them out from the chat field? Um. Well, I mean, I, I just wanted to mention that when people are growing these things in the lab, you know, usually as metal alloys, um, very often you get... You know, the really nice, big, pretty looking crystal has a defect in it, um, which has, you know, it makes them grow faster. Um, it's presumably a consequence of this forced tiling effect. Um, and my understanding was that that was actually down to a proof by Roger that this happened. Um, and somebody mentioned this other paper by Steinhardt from the 80s, I think it was, um, about these decapod defects. If somebody could put a a link to that in the chat i'd appreciate it because i don't i'm not aware of that paper i don't think so i was i was just saying that um you know real ones do this um, hillary i'll be i'll be i'll be I'll, I'll be slow about finding the link but i think the paper might be called growing perfect quasi crystals by paul and somebody else in the 80s right okay thanks yeah. no, okay. Uh, is there another comment by sorry Hillary, you're saying something? Um was there anything else that people wanted me to mention? I mean I put a link to my talk in the chat a while back. Um yeah. is there anything uh, else that anybody wants? No, I think that's good. Uh, there's a ch comment by Marcello Amaral. Uh, uh could you please uh, tell us about that paper you have linked? Um, I don't know if he's still there. Yeah, yeah so that one was uh, about uh, mainly Fibonacci chains. I'm trying to remember if it discussed uh, Fibonacci as well, but it was, it was using the inflation rule to try to get the the dynamics of uh, Fibonacci anion and grade relations. That went into the tiling space. It's about how to code in the tiling space, which mm -hmm. is uh, a similar concept to what later. But um, Nathan was focusing on the translation. Okay. So maybe yeah, I, I I just saw an animation on the on the chat. I just uh, posted the reference. 
Okay, but thank you. Thank you. I don't you. have a specific question. I'll thank you. Nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So probably we are moving towards the end if there are no more questions. Uh, so I just want to make a couple of general comments. So maybe Michael, would, if he's here, he should add to it. Uh, you remember we started in February uh, with, with Roger's talk on Twister Theory and Octonions. And isn't it interesting that the series ends with Penrose Dialings, which is a coincidence. It was not planned this way. And uh, we'll start next year around mid-Feb. We have to check with Roger for his dates. we we'll start with a talk from him on collapse of the wave function. And then more about white binaries from Xavier Hernandez. And then get back to you for the rest of the timetable. Michael, are you there? Of course, it's not a coincidence. It's, uh, Roger's just worked on a lot of interesting things. But, so thank you, Roger, I for coming so. to the talk. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you for the talk. Great, great fun. Yes, yeah. yes I, I am here, and thank you also, Roger, for coming to the talk and for contributing to such a fa fabulously rich discussion. Um, I think the, we, we couldn't have ended on the uh, series for this year on a, on a better note. Yeah, um, and, so we're looking yeah. forward to seeing everybody be back in, 20, in 2024, and uh, we'll be publishing the initial program for that soon. In the meantime, uh, have a very peaceful and uh, happy new year. And yes. we are happy that we lasted a full year. I mean, it's yeah. lucky that uh, the series could pull through for the year with your participation. We are especially happy about the discussion sessions, uh, which have been very rich, I think, more through and through for every talk, including today and the wide binaries discussion. Maybe I'm, I'm very tempted to ask Roger, if he would, if he thinks general relativity might be breaking down at low accelerations, like Milgram has suggested, <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, you must have thought about it sometime, perhaps. Low accelerations breaking down. Well, yes. What's he the means? Plan? He means. What do you think about Mond? Yeah, Mond. Yes. <laughs> yes. Ah. Uh, I'm not very keen on it, although I have an idea that some people might interpret little as Mons. It's not, it's not, what would I say? Um, the question of how you, how you phrase it. Uh, you see, I think dark matter, for, you see, the question is whether, that Mons more or less says that dark matter isn't there, and it's really you modify general relativity instead, and as I understand it. Yes, yes, yes. You see, I have a scheme which is not really that, but th that it is that dark matter is basically a gravitational thing. You see, it's not it's not a Mons theory. It's, these are genuinely particles. The, the, the dark matter particles are particles, but they are gravitational particles in the sense that they come about necessarily through the CCC program. If you have conformal cyclic cosmology, then you have to have, as part of the overall gravitational scheme, um, dark matter as as a sort of form of gravity. So it's yeah. the um, it's like see gravitons are are ordinary gravity, if you like, quantized. But these things are um, something which you necessarily have to have in the CCC model, mm -hmm. and they are. Particles in the in the genuine sense of being particles, so that's not mons, but on the other hand, they are gravitational entities. They will decay, and the decay products are necessarily gravitons. So that's mm -hmm. they're just made of gravitation, if you like, in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. But I don't but, think I would regard that as a mons type theory. I would regard it as a the dark matter. On the other hand, is um, mm -hmm. a a feature of the gravitational story. Put it like that. So, so when you when you say that these are gravitational entities, are they mediating some matter matter attraction? Uh, well, they are matter, but they're matter which is entirely gravitational. They don't have any. You see, as far as I know, there is no evidence of any kind of interaction between dark matter and anything else other than gravitational. 
Right, right. Because you would be that these are gravitational entities. They don't interact in, with things in any other way than gravitationally. Mm -hmm. um, but they have a have a lifetime, a half life of something like ten to the eleven years, mm -hmm. so that they most of it's still around. But there would be a certain depletion of these dark matter particles since the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. uh, but most of them are still around. But if you wait for a lot longer, they will eventually all disappear. And they're bosonic. They're bosonic. They would be bosonic. Yes. So I might think of. Something like a fifth force between a proton and an electron, say, mediated by these gravitational entities? I'm not thinking of it another force. It's still gravity. Oh. Okay, okay, okay. And they interact only gravitationally, as far as we know. Mm -hmm. And these things would be just gravitational things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they're a form of gravity. Mm -hmm. um, but then they would decay into, into actual gravitons. These would spin two particles mm -hmm. um, during the so course of... So they don't they don't dis distort general relativity in no. any way. No, they don't change well unless you extend general relativity to include them, you see. They're not mm -hmm. something which gives you a, they're not like a Mons picture where you you regard the general relativity of being <clears throat> having to be modified mm -hmm. to produce something which looks like dark matter but really is just a modification of GR. Mm -hmm. I understand to be the Mons idea. This yes. is the same as that. They're really particles. They really are there as particles. Okay. It's just they're, they're a form of gravity. Mm -hmm. Sort of the... Uh, did, you, did you write about this, Roger, in your work? Is there? Yes, is... there is a paper on this a long time ago. Yes, it's one of the papers I wrote. Um, I have to think of the... the uh, I'm thinking of it because in the paper I'm now writing with Christoph Meisner, and mm -hmm. we refer to that paper... <laughs> Okay, I, I'll look it up. I'll look it up. Yes, yes there is a paper. It, it goes back. I'm trying to think when it was. Um, no, I did describe that idea. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, because Can I ask a quick question before we close the Zoom? Uh, yeah, look, to, or I don't mean to interrupt. I'm just. I'm a little worried the Zoom is going to close before I before I get a copy of what, what's been in the chat, which I've completely missed. Just in case there's any any good references there, I should be looking at. Uh, is there, does anyone know if there's a way to get a copy of the chat? Oh, Michael. Is that like a Zoom feature where you could just Michael get a copy me. Yes, we, we can we can certainly we, we 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 preserve a copy of the chat and we can circulate that with the recording itself, I think. Oh yeah. It's a, it's a, it, it, yeah, if I, I if you just if you just email me a copy, that that would be that'd be that'd be great. I'm not, I, right. I think everybody else yeah. has been following it. I just didn't want to miss it. Well, I, I bagged I all so. the references, Latham. I can send you the links. Okay. Thank you, Hillary. Right, you're welcome. Yes. Also, why I brought it up, Roger, you might have heard recent developments about these wide binary stellar systems where the centripetal acceleration is below the MOND critical acceleration, and dark matter cannot be an explanation if there is a departure from Newtonian gravitation. So there are claims now that uh, these wide binary stellar systems disagree with Newton. Let them, of course, caution me that it's too early to start taking sides. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm not aware of them. I'm sorry. Yes, I don't know. But but if they disagree with Newton, how about Einstein? Though, do they disagree with Einstein? Yes, yes, because it is non-relativistic. Yeah, I see. It would have it would cause GR also to sort of run into trouble if the if these wide binaries uh, 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 are shown to disagree. At least two authors are claiming uh, so that there's a problem. I'm not aware of it. No. Okay. Yeah, so after your after your talk next year, the next talk would be on wide binaries again. So. Uh, I'll try to send you a reminder. Maybe if you come, we could have an interesting uh, chat about it. Yeah. So uh, around mid-Feb, we have to send you a date, Roger. I hope that'll be okay. We'll okay, you... well, we'll work that out. Yes, okay. Okay, so, that, so Michael, wind it up. Uh, if uh, you would let them... Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm just them. unmuting. Uh, yes, sure, uh, Tinjin, if you want to wind it up. Let them, if you could kindly uh, unshare.
so that we can see everybody on the screen. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, so there's not many of us left at this moment. <laughs> but uh, just to sort of formally say bye to everyone. Happy Christmas. All right. Happy New Year. Bye, everyone. Merry what Christmas. a fest. <laughs> right. Happy bye. New Year. Good here. See you all in 2024. Bye. See you in 2024. All the very best. Thanks bye. to everybody. Ciao. Grazie. Bye. Michael, you can close the window then. I you will. Next year. Once again, thank you, everyone.